Our members supported NPR and PBS station for Philadelphia, South Jersey, and Delaware. We'd like to thank all of our members in the audience today. Without your support, we would not be able to put on a program like this. If you have supported WHYY, especially in the last 10 months, we sincerely thank you. It's not just something for you. It's an asset that impacts your entire community and your support is massively appreciated. So again, thank you so, so much. And without further ado, I will hand it off to the very festive Kehlani Palmasano with her blazing fire in the background yeah. to introduce our first guest, Kehlani Palmasano. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Thank you. And it's such a pleasure to be here. And I love it. It's the holiday season. It's time for sharing joy, spreading cheer, and of course, engaging with time-honored traditions. It's our holiday traditions that close out the year by reminding us of who we are, where we've come from and where we're headed. And though we may have different traditions, celebration, the act of celebrating is a universal language and food, food is the centerpiece of that celebration. And when it comes to holiday foods, no matter what culture you're from or what heritage you're part of, each dish is packed with symbolism, it's packed with mythology, and there's a lot of deep meaning baked into it uh, that gives a lot of meaning to the festive season. Uh, food connects us and it's something that we gather around. And though this year is different and we can't gather the way that we normally do, sharing our food Food traditions can bring us close to heart. Uh, so that's what this virtual event is all about. And I'm going to bring on our first guest, uh, Tova Duplessis. Uh, if you could turn on your camera and I'll, I'll do a little intro. Tova, uh, she uh, was raised in a Jewish household in South Africa and she spent her Fridays baking braided challah bread and cooking elaborate meals for Shabbat with her family. Uh, she came over to the United States to go to college and she thought she was pursuing a career in medicine, but really grew to love food. Uh, after doing a very elaborate tour de Philadelphia through some of Philadelphia's finest restaurants, including uh, Citron and Rose, it looks like Zahav, Le Bec Finn, um, you know, you opened up Essen Bakery, which is, uh, if I'm correct, it's on past East Passion Ave. Correct. Yes, yes, and it's a, uh, it's pulling from Jewish traditions, Mediterranean traditions, um, and you've also uh, been nominated. What was it? Your fourth year as a semifinalist for James Beard Award for Outstanding yes. Baker. <laughs> yes. Hi, Congrats Connie. to yeah. you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about, you know, your holiday traditions. So I, I love what you said because I feel exactly the same way that um, food is always at the center of holiday traditions. And that's exactly how I feel about my upbringing. Every holiday that we celebrated had its own foods that went along with that holiday. And it's kind of what made me most excited about every holiday was the food that we were going to eat and my mom is an incredible cook um and i grew up with amazing food um so for hanukkah the traditions are um latkes and donuts and i made some latkes tonight they came out really good it, yes yes yours are like fantastic i made and an attempt at chips <laughs> I made an attempt at latkes this it, evening. It, here are yours and here are mine. What do you think? Uh, yours, <laughs> mine are a lot more pancakey. They're yeah. very firm. I, they're, lots of oil happened to them. So I'd love to hear your tips of how to, you know, you'd think that potatoes would be easy, but they're really difficult. <laughs> no, there are a bunch of things that you have to know. Um, there, there are some really important tips. And, and with something like, like, like you're saying, it's just potatoes at the end of the day. But um, when frying a potato, there's all this technique that goes into it. And so you just need these tips. You don't even need a recipe really, because it's it's very much to taste. Okay. But, um, but my tips are the following. So um, I grate the potato on a coarse grater. So you should use either box grater or a food processor with like a large grater attachment. Um, and with some onion, I do about like one medium onion to every like four large russet potatoes. Russet are great for, um, for latkes because they're, they're a starchier potato and it's really the starch that's gonna crisp up. So with latkes, water is your enemy and starch is your friend. 
So you really want to squeeze out all that water. What I do is I grate my potatoes with the onion um, and then I put that into a mesh, like a mesh sieve over a bowl so that all the liquid drains out. Um, but you'll find, and, and I let that sit like at least 30 minutes so that all the liquid will come out and you have like really dry shredded potatoes in the end. Um, and I'll let that sit for about 30 minutes. Um, and and the water that comes out will have, you'll, you'll notice at the end has some potato starch in it. It kind of looks like cornstarch, like puddles on the bottom. Yeah. You pour out the liquid, keep that starch and stir that back in to your potatoes. Um, add one egg, a little bit of flour. You may have gone with a little too much. Did you use flour? Oh, tons. <laughs> yeah. So I only do like a tablespoon of flour for my whole batch. Really? That's it? Oh, I was yeah, really thinking it was going to be more. <laughs> no, because you only need it to bind a little bit. I use one egg, a tablespoon. If it's a big batch, maybe two tablespoons of flour. Just enough to just bind your potato when you like smash it in the pan. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but enough to like still keep that... Um, that potato tech, the grated potato texture. What happened with yours is because of all the potato, you kind of landed up with a cake texture. I mean, because I sure of all did. <laughs> yes, yeah. I did. It is yeah. more and, of and a baking pancake situation. Are okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a thing. Some people like them that way. I prefer a super crispy, like, you know, like, um, yeah, it shredded kind of. Right, I, I like when you have like, there's a little bit of crispy, it's like a little soft on the inside, but you have the texture of all of the little potato shavings thrown in there. Yeah, and they like yeah. the little bits falling off. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Yours look very dressed up with options that I've never seen at any diner. Can you please walk us through your latka feast you've got there? So I decided that I wanted to put on top of my latkes um, some labna cheese, uh, which is a Mediterranean or Middle Eastern um, strain cheese. It's basically like a, like a Greek yogurt, really similar. It's really tangy, um, really smooth. It's like, a, it's like a tangy sour cream, pretty much. Um, and so I put some labna on there um, and smoked salmon and pickled red onions and dill so they're Ooh. pretty fancy That's dill good. it dill goes so nice with salmon oh my goodness that, sure. that, it's, a, it's a great combo and for pickled onions all you need to do is throw some um slice up some red onions throw red, red wine vinegar over it pinch of salt and just let it sit for a while and you have pickled onions Oh, well, I'm going to have to give latkes another go. So do you happen to know um, how latkes kind of became a Hanukkah tradition or can they be eaten during other Jewish holidays? Uh -oh. I, so I know that these fried foods are a tradition because of the miracle that happened on Hanukkah, which is the event that we're celebrating. Um, and and there was when when Jerusalem was under siege, um, there was one little jug of oil in the temple to light the candelabra in the temple or the menorah in the temple. Um, and somehow the jug lasted a full eight nights when it wouldn't have been in, normally been enough. That's the story. If it happened, I can't tell you, but it's the reason that we, um, that we eat fried foods to remind us of the oil that lasted eight days. I never made that connection. I under I knew the story of how the oil had lasted eight days and that's why Hanukkah is eight days and why you have the menorah with eight candles. Um, but I had I did not make the connection between that and fried food. Oh, the other... are fried. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I don't know our... why it's latkes though. I don't know why it's potatoes. I, you know, latkes in particular, I can't tell you why, but I know that that's why all the, all the foods are fried. Do, do donuts also fit into that fried yes, festivities? Exactly. Oh, please the tell me more about these donuts. Oh my God. So we make donuts at the bakery. They're awesome. Um, we're going to have a limited quantity in the bakery for all of Hanukkah. Uh, but, but they're the traditional, they're called sufganiyot. They're the filled, um, they're like filled from the top. Um, so they're a yeast or donut and we have three different fillings. We have raspberry. Um, we're making a, um, you would love this. It's a, it's a coffee rum from Hawaii and we um, make a custard with that. 
It's so good. So it's a coffee rum custard and then um, a cookies and cream version as well. Cookies and cream. For everyone's taste. Oh, my. Um, yeah. And we'll have them all week long at the bakery. Um, if you can't snag any at the bakery, I would recommend also in South Philly, Friend Jelly's uh, Bakery on 9th and Rittner. They're like a little known gem in South Philly. I love their donuts. Oh, delicious. Is there a particular donut you like to get there? Um, I'm, not, I'm a chocolate glazed. I don't, I'm just a chocolate glazed fan. But you actually have to try the Frenoli. They have like a um, a, cano a, fr a a cannoli. <laughs> it's inspired by cannoli, but it's a donut and it's stuffed with a ricotta Ooh. filling. And yeah, that that's their known. But I always go for like the I always go for the jelly and the chocolate glazed. Oh, that sounds absolutely wonderful. Um, you have been all over the world, having been born and grown up in um, in South Africa and then moving over to the United States. And so what was it like, um, you know, practicing your holiday traditions in different countries? What was it like growing up in South Africa and, and celebrating Hanukkah? So something that's so funny about um, the holiday season um, is that it's summer for us in December. Oh yeah. So, so we grew up with like movies about like a white Christmas. I mean, we don't even get snow anyway. But uh, the whole idea of it being like cold on Christmas is so bizarre. <laughs> oh no, but it's, so, it's funny that you say that because two years ago I was in New Zealand and they are big on Christmas. And when I got to Auckland, there was a Christmas parade happening and everybody was dressed up as Santa. They had the, there were snow, like snow globe floats yeah. and everything. And like everything was all winter, but it's the beginning of their summer and their Christmas tree is like the Putakawa tree, which has the uh, beautiful like red thistles that, um, that bloom from it. But I'm imagining, yeah, in South Africa, there's yeah. all of this. Um, but that's totally a yeah. to us. Like, I mean, we we like dream about a Christmas where it's cold and you're inside and you're snuggled up by the tree and it sounds wonderful but it's just not it's just not our Christmas so yeah. I always grew up with that as like this fantasy and um, actually my mom is from Canada and she would tell me about um, the holiday season and when and she's from Montreal so it's really cold there oh yeah and just how beautiful downtown Montreal was and how all the stores would like decorate their windows and I just grew up with these stories and then I actually when I moved to America I came to New York first and oh, very classic was, it just blew my mind because I I walked to I, I I lived in Midtown so I walked to Rockefeller Center on Christmas Eve oh my goodness. and it was like magical to me like that really, is I that is like every movie. single holiday movie. You got to go to Rockefeller. Did you do the ice skating around the rink? No, I, I never skated at Rockefeller. <laughs> Believe it, no worries. I, I haven't skated since 1998. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I know specifically the date and everything. I remember it distinctly because I was so bad at it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I, I love that. So, um, you know, so you lived in, in New York. What was that big jump uh, from South Africa to New York like? Um, I, it, was a, it was quite a culture shock. And I definitely was pretty homesick for probably a few years, um, you know, after moving here. But, um, but now, now America's home for me, especially being here um, in Philly, I feel like... Um, I, I feel very rooted here. It feels like home to me. I've been here for 15 years and um, and I love it. And and even though I grew up Jewish with Jewish traditions, we have friends from all backgrounds and it's actually been so nice. And we were talking about that, how I used to have a holiday party so people could yes. see our traditions, but it's been so nice being involved in everyone else's traditions. Uh, you know, and, and I feel like that's what, the, that's what the holiday season has become about for us is you know, like going, and it's so sad that we can't do it this year, but we would I go know. to each other, like little parties and gatherings. And yes, this is the highlight of my holiday season. This is the only party that I've been invited to. Uh, <laughs> oh, <me too. laughs> 
<laughs> this is the only party I'll be at this year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, with the holidays being different, um, what are some ways that you're going to, you know, mark the occasion and celebrate the holiday season now that, like, it is going to be different, but, like, you know, yeah. how are you going to be marking the occasion? So I have a daughter, and she's five, and she's very excited about Hanukkah. Um, and so we will be lighting candles every night. Um, oh. We didn't used to be so, like, maybe we did the first night and second night, maybe, but we didn't used to, like, you know, stick to the whole eight nights. And I think we're going to do that this year because it stretches it out and it makes it such a, and I, I remember growing up with that. My dad would light the candles every night and we would sing the songs and, and it really, like, stretches out the holiday over this, like, week-long period. Do you uh, ever get like the holiday fatigue that by day six, you're like, okay, two more days of this. To totally like not. Cause <laughs> I love it. I love the like lighting candles and singing the song and it, no, I love it. There's no holiday fatigue for me. I can't have enough holidays. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for sharing your holiday traditions with us. Those latkes look amazing, and we'll bring, thank we'll, bring, you. we'll bring Tova back at the uh, at the end. Uh, we'll bring everybody back for uh, some questions. You know, all these latkes are going to be gone. <laughs> but we'll see <laughs> like yeah I guess in the next 40 minutes if they're all gone then we know you will have eaten well um next up I'm going to bring on Tanya Tanya if you could turn on your microphone and your camera there you are I didn't see you before hi okay I have to turn my camera on right yes Oh no, you can't start your video because the host has stopped it, it says. Oh, let me see if I can do it on my end then. Uh, I cannot, um, but while uh, hopefully our tech behind the, uh, behind the curtain, <laughs> working <laughs> behind the scenes can help you with that. In the meantime, I will introduce <laughs> Tanya. Uh, <laughs> Tanya uh, Hopkins, is, she goes by the Food Griot on her social media platforms. Uh, and her primary focus is discovering and sharing inclusive and nearly lost uh, food and drink history narratives of the Americas. She is the creator and the host of the Philadelphia Citizens Food is in podcast, which is one of the first uh, food history podcasts. Uh, which is a phenomenal, like, listen, like, she has a great episode. I loved the one on the pepper, the Philadelphia pepper pot. Um, so she's done some great work there. Uh, she also conducts live storytelling events and presentations in classrooms, museums, and other cultural and nonprofit organizations. Uh, she also makes on-air appearances in a uh, on TV, video, film, radio, uh, and she also moderates panel discussions. Uh, and she's a wine, she's also, in addition to her food expertise, she's also an expertise in wine and spirits education and also helps to organize uh, food and wine pairings. Perfect timing, that was, that was the intro. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm great. Hi, Kalani. I love the fire in the background. I love Thank that. Thank you. Yeah, I got really festive in my living room. Everything outside of the box is a mess. <laughs> but that box is on point. Okay. And my computer's yeah. sitting on a big bucket of double bubble gum. <laughs> Fun fact, I had my husband take photos earlier and he was like, I'm not taking a photo of the bucket of bubble gum. And I was like, why? It's behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. <laughs> it yeah. was behind the scenes. But yes, thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of your work deals with uh, the food history of the Americas, but also shining a light on the African-American contribution. Uh, and not just, not just African-American, but the Black experience uh, the whole diaspora of the you know the contribution of the West Indies the contributions of uh, southern Africans and of course or, you know southern um, south our southern our south of you know exactly yes and the north and the midwest and, the and all of it the great migration yeah. all of the amazing things that a lot of people wouldn't realize uh, in a lot of the foods that we all enjoy most of them have gone through the hands of Black Americans. Huge contributions from whiskey, 
uh, all the way through rice. American bourbon. Yeah. Beer. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Huge. Industry and ice cream, which is an episode. People yes, that is an episode. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to so talk it, to you about Kwanzaa, but go ahead. go ahead. Oh, no, no. I was going to lead into that. You're Tell us a little bit about Kwanzaa. <laughs> Yeah, I tweeted out, I don't even know if it made sense because you know when you're doing 10 things at once that I'm going to be talking about the, um, oh, hot spiced holiday drinks and, yes. and uh, which links to pepper pod and, uh, and the kind of those spices that we associate with this time of year, you know, those, um, those the warm, aromatic. Holiday. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Talk a little bit about that. And, um, and the deliciously diverse foods of the African diaspora that are perfect for Kwanzaa. Oh, and yes. yeah, Kwanzaa is seven days. So if you're a foodie, it's a great excuse to feature something different from throughout that diaspora that you just uh, uh, described um, each day. But then the sixth night is like the big Kuumba feast. Kuumba means creativity uh, in, in Swahili. Each day has a different principle, mm -hmm. um, starting off with unity and uh, and ending on faith and money. But the, one of the things I love about Kwanzaa also is that it's uh, a great way to start the new year. You know, it takes place those seven days between uh, the day after Christmas to it, the last day is the first day of the new year. And so, um, you know, ha if you have spent some time thinking about the principles, which are really beautiful and relevant to all cultures, um, it's a great way to start off with, you know, a good mindset. And good New Year's resolutions. Absolutely, um, and I know uh, one of the drink recommendations, which I brewed a little before we started, the hibiscus tea. And you actually had developed a uh, beautiful cocktail for it. Can you walk us through that? Yes, while I yeah. drink it. Yeah. <laughs> well, we drink. I'm drinking a version, so I actually, mm. I actually heard it. Cheers. 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 Observe the cinnamon stick strategically mm. located. Festive. The, um, That's Instagram ready. Yeah, right. I simmered it a little too long. It's delicious, but what happens when you over simmer? It can turn. It turns colors, and it can. If you want to keep the vibrant, like you know, Christmas red, don't over simmer uh, the hibiscus. So yeah, for a mock um, holiday, for a mock, I call it a um, hot spiced um, mock mold wine. You can use that beautiful red hibiscus tea leaf, which is originally from Africa and comes to the New World through the transatlantic slave trade along with the people. And it's really popular, much more popular throughout the Caribbean and um, parts of coastal parts of Mexico where it's made into drinks like uh, sorrels, one of the most traditional drinks coming out of Jamaica and other Caribbean um, islands. I don't have West Indian her heritage. I have North American um, heritage that goes back to uh, tobacco plantations of Virginia and Maryland, but um, you know, hibiscus. You know, when I when I through scholarship and through other friends and cronies and colleagues learned about um, and started to use hibiscus more, I was like, this is amazing. This needs to be turned. I know there's sorrel like that's chilled and you know consumed all year long, but I'm like, let's heat this up and turn it into a um, hot spiced hibiscus holiday drink, shall we? Definitely, and, right. And so, you know, mulling goes way back. It starts with wine. I actually did a wine version for tonight. Um, a lot of the alcohol cooks off and there's also some hibiscus. This is a combo. There's some hibiscus and a little tart cherry. So the, the mm. trick to um, the recipe I developed for the mock mold wine is in addition to, so hold yours up. There's a little, it's a little clear, right? Yes. It's lovely. Did you, and how did you spice yours? Oh, I mean, it was already, so I'm, I cheated. It was, a, it was a hibiscus tea blend. So it already had a lot of um, like cinnamon and a little bit of citrus um, elements in there. Like, I think there was like a little bit of orange rind in there. So those are the like, that's what's coming through and complementing the floral kind of flavor of the hibiscus that the hibiscus naturally has, which is a really amazing flower. It's so tart, right? You almost oh, don't yeah. need the citrus, but um, yeah, because it's, it's got that tangy mouth-watering acidity. Mm -hmm. but yeah, so you can still squirt, you know, put a little orange uh, juice or peel or lime or lemon in there. Um, yeah, we talked about that, right? Last week, how there's yeah. a million ways you can do this. You can definitely go the easy way. If you're, you know, if you're one of those people who likes to get crafty or complicated or, you know, or whatever, you can go old school and, you know, use whole spices and, you know, oh, yeah. some cinnamon. And this is some uh, whole peppercorns, which is um, 
another thing you can add. That's a really good it. idea. I love, yeah. um, I love pink peppercorns for more sweet things because they have a little bit more of a subtle pepperiness to them. But uh, if you don't have pink peppercorn, I'm sure regular peppercorn is fine. Regular too. peppercorn, pink peppercorn, white yes. peppercorn, that's the thing, you know, and, you know, to the, to the, the theme of creativity, you know, I don't, I don't, recipes can often, often confine people to, and be restrictive. And I think that they're often better left as a creative outlet and a creative expression. And so you can, you know, be as complicated as you want. You can use, you know, whole nutmeg or shave it if you want, plop it in. So I, I had fun and it really didn't take that long using the whole versions of the three things I showed, plus some fresh uh, sliced ginger and um, there's something else. I'm, oh, some allspice, which kind of looks like the pepper, oh, which yes. actually is a version of pepper, an early version of pepper, which is a key or I shouldn't say an early version. It was referred to as pepper. And that's also coming out of the um, West African culinary and medicinal use and finds its way in the pepper pot soup and also in mold um, wines, which have more of a European association coming out of the like German and Swedish and English it's called glue wine and German. Glue vine, genau. Glue vine, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but long before the, you know, and those are ancient traditions, old, old traditions of, um, and really it's all about like, you know, fresh wine is fine, but we all know if wine doesn't stay fresh very long, right? Exactly. So, so to not waste, you know, wine that is starting to get a little whatever uh, stale, you, you spice it up, you warm it up in the winter, you want to, you want to warm yourself up. Also the healing properties in, in these spices that come later after the spice trade, but mm -hmm. earlier European versions might have had um, local bark and, and honey and different things. But it's a these heating drinks, especially wine with spices and honey. There's there are records of it in Mesopotamia and Egypt, Greece, um, throughout Europe, even in sub-Saharan Africa places. Here, you know, it comes to the U.S. mostly through the the European settlers, but. Um, the pepper pot episode, which everybody should listen to. I um, highly recommend it. It is very good. It's a great, um, stew. it's a great holiday stew because it's got those flavors. You know, you can, I don't put cinnamon and nutmeg in there, but I do put a lot of allspice and black pepper and, um, you know, that along with, you know, either the mold, the mock mold wine or the actual, it's like, I don't know. I think we're keeping our immune system strong with some, uh, some uh, healing spices and yes yeah and and you know the the pepper pot that you had talked about in your episode of the food is in on the Philadelphia Citizen um you know that is the one of the perfect expressions of Philadelphia food because Philadelphia was a major seaport city it was seeing ingredients come to its shores from all over the world. It was also part of that um, African, the, the slave trade as well. So it's the influence of people from the Car Caribbean, because you were mentioning that that dish appears in almost all of the islands of the Caribbean, just in different variations, correct? Yeah, there's a version of pepper pot um, on, on I'm, from what I'm told, I have not been to every single Caribbean island. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hardly. I have a handful. However, through research and study and talking yeah. to people, my understanding is that every single place has a their version of a pepper pot. That yes, um, and you know that's what I love so much about it is that like it has become synonymous over the years. It's become synonymous with Philadelphia, and I think like you know popular legends like uh, how it fed soldiers during the Revolutionary War. Um, people, the pop history of it, people kind of forget the uh, Caribbean and the Black American contributions to that dish. But if you always, if you look at the ingredients and you look at the way that it's made and you look at the people where, like where it came from, that, that impression is still there. The evidence of who cooked that dish before we enjoy it today or even before Washington's troops uh you know used it to sustain themselves you know it's very evident and very clear like yeah and where it's those influences come from yeah and absolutely it actually traces the triangle you know it originates in West Africa it really blossoms in the West Indies because that's when the peppers the capsicum pepper peppers which are indigenous to that part of the new world get folded into the you know this type of pepper Yes. Um, to add even more heat and flavor. And then it gets to Philadelphia in the 1700s through women who are, it's the last stop on some of these trading ships. And um, 
they there's all these exotic ingredients and and these people who know these ingredients and what to do with them and they set up camp and become the first street vendors to sell this really hot soup um they have songs to go with it and i can imagine you know uh yeah before before fast food before takeout before restaurants before you know any of that you know how wonderful it might have been to, to be able to get some hot soup on the fly oh know? yeah and they were getting it right so, from the seaport all those fresh ingredients oh delightful yeah, they were like, early entrepreneurs in philadelphia for you know definitely three, three people um you know making this soup at a time where you know people were not free in most other uh states in the union at the time yes the and yeah. so you know you're talking about uh the African influence and the African diaspora. And one of the things that connects a lot of people who have been displaced in all of our history, you know, celebrations can connect us near and far. And though we might come from, you know, different places around the world or come from different heritages, a holiday like Kwanzaa gives, you know, Black Americans a shared experience. So tell us a little bit more about like food traditions with Kwanzaa. I know you were talking about there was uh, the feast day, which is the sixth day on New Year's yeah. Eve. Yeah. yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Well, okay, so Kwanzaa, first let me just back up and say it's the, um, you know, the newest of uniquely American holidays, which all of which are mythical and made up in many ways, but meaningful, right? And take play, take root in the culture. And the same thing with Kwanzaa, which is created in 1966 by Dr. Milana Karenga. And you can learn more about the details in the Kwanzaa episode of uh, the um, the Foodist in um, podcast. I'll post I'll post that um, if you guys I think I have my thing here to follow. You can find that um, uh, if you follow me later or we can follow up but it's 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 a lot of really rich history based on harvest rituals the synthesis of harvest rituals throughout the ancient rituals throughout Africa and so when you have that you're dealing with foods right you're dealing with whatever was harvested around that time uh, there's a concept of first fruits which is which also has some spirituality linked to Christianity but let me say that Kwanzaa is not a religious holiday at all it is a cultural one that was born in that that uh, decade of the 60s where black identity, black power, soul train, all kinds of things started to emerge as a, a reaction to, or, you know, a final, I mean, these things have been happening all along, but it gets onto the mainstream in terms of, you know, black people are not darker white people. We have a culture, we have a history, we have a pride. There is a lot there. So Kwanzaa is, is kind of born to address that. And um, it's, it's, you know, since then it, it took some while to become adopted and, and still a lot of, not everyone practices it, but I think that everyone, I, I know that everyone knows about it now and acknowledges it and, and people, I, I can see it's been picking up a lot of um, traction over the years, which is kind of exciting. And it's celebrated worldwide. And, you know, it's celebrated by people of African heritage, people who um, also appreciate African heritage and want to, you know, it's a great, ambassadorship into the culture. And so there are seven days, like I was saying, and don't make me tell you all of them um, <laughs> in order. Uh, but uh, I was saying, you know, Umoja and, and uh, Kuji Chagalia, like, there's a lot of syllables in some of them, but on the sixth day, which is uh, actually New Year's Eve, December 31st, is um, the traditions to have a big uh, uh, feast. And um, it was so great. Uh, back, uh, when was that? I guess it was in the late 90s when I first started to research foods associated with Kwanzaa. I had a chance to attend. I got invited to go to the one that Dr. Uh, Karenga does in Los Angeles. And, um, and you know, there's a lot more, there's a lot of rituals. There's less focus on, at, at the one, the official one that they do, less focus on the food and more on the rituals and the dancing and the children and the singing and the, and mm -hmm. but there's always a basket of fruit in the middle of the table. And, um, you know, it can be any kind of fruit. Usually it's citrus or, or whatever. An ear of corn represents the children. There's a cup. I should have that set up here. Our family Kwanzaa setup is in California where my where my parents are, where I will not be this oh, year. Yeah. So I just have my little makeshift, uh, I, I, you know, have a Kwanzaa book so you guys oh, can see nice. what the Nara would look like. <laughs> You know, with the, yeah, with the holidays being the way that they are this year, do you have any, uh, you know, ways that you'll be marking the occasion? 
Oh yeah. So as a wine educator, I'm going to be featuring a different uh, black winemaker for the seven days of Kwanzaa. Uh, Cause one of the things is a cup. That's also a key part of the, um, the setup for libations and unity. And um, often of course, if it's, it's a family of children involved, there's not wine in that cup. But when you're doing Kwanzaa for grownups who like, who appreciate wine, uh, I'll be featuring a different uh, black winemaker, some from the continent of Africa, America, Europe for the seven days. What else? I'll be making some pepper pot. Uh, I'll continue to perfect my hot spiced wine, hot spiced hibiscus uh, mock oh, yes. cold wine. And um, yeah, I've been making this like, I don't know, every night uh, since we started talking about this event, you know, and I was like, okay, I'm going to just practice, I'm going to perfect the recipe. And, <laughs> and most nights I've been doing it with the, the hibiscus and the tart cherry and the spices, but there's my body is like loving it's like there's something it just feels so good it's just uh I don't know it's good for it's just good for something I'm sure it's good for the immune system and your gut and all kinds it's, of things. it is very refreshing yeah and it's delicious yeah so is there, I'll be yeah, doing I, that I'll be zooming with my family oh and, good oh Kwanzaa cookies there are Kwanzaa cookies oh that's right that, yeah yes that, uh, that um uh, there's a recipe on the Philadelphia Citizen Kwanzaa episode linked to that. Uh, and um, that's a fun thing to do with, with because another thing, Kwanzaa is also very, very kid centric and you want to do different crafts and holidays. So on the day of creativity, it's fun to make a healthy cookie. Uh, and I like to use like um, maple syrup or, or uh, coconut crystals for the sugar. Um, flowers that just happen to be gluten-free. Sometimes they have higher protein, higher, higher fiber. Um, so I like to think of it like not just as an indulgence in the traditional commercial way, but how can we live the principles of Kwanzaa and nourish ourselves and each other and, you know, really think um, collectively, you know, and, um, and which, which often involves, you know, you want to heal, you want to be better, you want to be healthy. Be yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really beautiful. And, you know, I remember you mentioning, um, was there any symbolism behind the red foods? Was that something that was like, you need to have something like, or prosperity foods for New Year's Eve? Oh, right, right, right. The red foods links to Juneteenth. Oh, which, okay, which yes. We, we can talk about in, I don't know, six or seven months if you want to. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I have a red drink for that one, which is a cold cocktail because it's June. Yes. And uh, there is hibiscus involved, but also the strawberry, other things to make that red. And that has a whole nother story. But I just, um, you know, when I thought about um, holiday drinks, you know, eggnog and hot cider and and hot spiced wine or mold wine or glue wine, but that's, you know, kids can't really enjoy that. Um, I was like, why isn't there a red holiday drink? I've got to come up with a red yeah. holiday. So I, so I kind of dipped back in and pulled the hibiscus and the tart cherry and, and all the spices I was telling you and, and uh, came up with a, a recipe for that, which, which is not quite ready, but um, stay tuned. I'll keep you posted. I'll keep you posted, Kalani. And oh, definitely. You can share it with everybody. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you so much. This has been so enlightening. I love all of the amazing hibiscus tips. It has opened up my mind to the possibilities of hibiscus and loved talking about pepper pot. So um, I'm going to bring on now Jeff, uh, who is our final speaker. And then I'll bring everybody, you, you as well, Tanya, I'll bring everybody back at the end for questions and for, you know, just the holiday chat. Um, but thank you so much again, uh, Jeff. Um, you can turn on your camera and turn on your microphone and show us your very festive. Oh, <laughs> Kaylani Palmazano, as I live and breathe. How are you? Are oh, you? I didn't mean to barge in on you there. Sorry, I was just putting up my stockings, just getting ready. Wow, it is Christmas overload in your office. <laughs> yes, yeah, big fan, love Christmas. Oh, yes. Well, let me do, you know, your introduction as well, which is 
you know, talk about a uh, master of many things. Uh, Jeff Jackson was born on the shores of the Red Sea. Uh, as a child, he was ranked among the top 10 skiers in the United States. He attended several boarding schools and was forcibly ejected from most of them. Uh, he decorated, he's a decorated haiku champion. Uh, Jeff has told jokes, stories, and stories in coffee shops, bookstores, nightclubs, tiki bars, and punk rock basements across the US, UK, and Canada. And now he's here to share with us some of his holiday stories and holiday traditions. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, well, it's, it's a real thrill to be here. Thank you for including me in this wonderful event. You are full of amazing stories, my friend. Uh, <laughs> um, please share with us what it was like celebrating the holidays as a child. I understand when you say the Red Sea, was this your time in um, thinking of my geography? Where were you? Yes, so um, I spent many of my formative years in Saudi Arabia. My father was a mechanical engineer and he had uh, an opportunity to do some some work over there. And so we, we as a family lived over there for many years. I was born in Yambu, which is on the west coast of Saudi Arabia, the east coast of the Red Sea. But much of my childhood was spent on the other side of the country in a place called Dahran, which is in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia. Um, and we loved, as a family, loved Christmas. And clearly the tradition lives on. Uh, we loved it, we loved it. It was, but I was generally raised with it almost in a, in a secular, way or even I, I suppose the closest you would get maybe a deist but it wasn't it wasn't packaged as an overtly uh, Christian thing that we did however by virtue of living in Saudi Arabia certainly at the time and I believe currently uh, the practice was strictly prohibited nationally it was against the law so when we would participate in Christmas it was uh, a bit of an adventure so because it was prohibited anytime at least from what I've observed, anytime that something is banned, a, a rather vigorous black market will spring up in order to fill that need. So instead of uh, you know illicit illicit drugs, there were people that we knew who were able to get you Christmas decorations, Christmas trees, because you couldn't you couldn't buy them. So like I know a guy who knows a guy who's working on the army base. Wow. He's not being paid enough. He's bringing back some Christmas trees, uh, you know, plastic fold up Christmas trees. We can get them for you for a great price. Well. Wow. So, so we're talking Christmas trees. We're talking, are we talking lights? Like what other things? You know, <laughs> yeah, we, so, yeah. you know, in my mind, it's like, so you get this Christmas. So what do you do when you get the Christmas tree? Do you put it in a room and then draw the shades and? Oh yes. Well, it gets, it gets a little complicated from there. Um, so you mentioned lights. I do want to say that, yeah, lights were not, uh, were not available with the exception of those icicle lights, those single color icicle lights. For really? some reason, one could get those, uh, which I've maintained indicates that they have no business in a proper in a proper Christmas decoration. It's like, listen, you can get those. Instead. Well, they, like, they have like mad winter vibes and I'm not thinking that Saudi Arabia has winters that, you know, we're accustomed. Does it, does it snow in Saudi Arabia? Um, well. Or, or in certain, like, I guess the, like mountainous areas. I think, yeah, there is a mountainous region called the Asir <laughs> where I believe it has snowed uh, at some time in the past, but I don't want to go on record for the, uh, the, the, the climate specifically, that's a little outside of my purview. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the decorations, I mean, we lived in an oil company town, so it was almost like a private community that was half Texas, half the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So there were certain special dispensations. If you could get the decorations in to this compound, then one could put them up. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. So, and how long, you know, were you having these clandestine Christmases? Um, how many years? Oh God, I guess, uh, I guess we were there. Mm, my, my parents were there off and on for uh, 20 years, but we as a family lived there in this particular stretch that I'm discussing uh, just over a decade. Just oh my goodness. So it was great. That is, yeah, that is very formative. So when you left, uh, where did you go to after Saudi Arabia? Mm, the family moved to Arizona, uh, mm -hmm. the desert Southwest. Uh, my father's and, you know, what was it like going from Christmases in Saudi Arabia to Christmases where you could, ha you could, you could celebrate Christmas out loud? <laughs> um, it was great. It was great. Yeah. Uh, live trees every year for sure. 
uh, fresh trees. The trees got, I think they got bigger and bigger every year for a while. Um, but yeah, everyone was, I don't know, thoroughly excited about it. We loved having the Christmas movies on TV, episodes of classic Christmas shows, that sort of thing. It was great. Wow. I mean, we had, we had a great time celebrating in Saudi too. It was just yeah. we had to like smuggle in wrapping paper because there isn't there there is a, a gift giving tradition within Saudi Arabia for the two Eids, but there isn't really the same of like wrapping it in festive things, and certainly not with Santa Claus on the outside of it. So we'd have to bring wrapping paper into the country and then very carefully save it for the next year because it was difficult difficult to get wrapping paper. It was a wild. Oh my time. goodness! Yeah, that is that is a wild time and. Was it in Saudi Arabia that your mom made extremely elaborate gingerbread houses? That's correct. That's correct. So the tradition started before then. I think she she inherited some cast iron molds from, I believe it was from her grandmother, who was a baker. And um, the uh, customs and immigration at the border was very elaborate. They would open everybody's bags and search everything. They'd open, the, they'd tear everything apart, look through your bag. Uh, but for some reason, because the, the molds are sort of a void, I guess they didn't look overtly Christmassy, so they were able to uh, to make it in. So every year, and in fact, I was just speaking with my, with my mother yesterday, and she's making gingerbread, or she was making gingerbread yesterday. So oh, she'd make sweet. tons and tons of houses and Christmas trees, very elaborate, all sorts of candies. Um, still makes them. They were given out to friends, uh, school teachers, neighbors, that sort of thing. Oh, that's so cool. Did you decorate these houses with her or were you not allowed in the kitchen? Mm, we were generally not allowed in because we would eat, we would eat all the candy and the cookies. <laughs> Before they could <laughs> become little like, sh like a uh, little roofs and little gumdrop fence posts and. <laughs> yeah, because so you would have everything uh, counted out very, very meticulously in terms of like the colors of the Skittles and the dip a special pattern and uh, if there were Hershey Kisses, you know, she needed a certain number for each house. We were called in whenever a cookie dropped. If there was a cookie that was that was burnt accidentally or if it fell off of the counter and broke, that was about the extent of, of our involvement was cleaning that up. True story. That's Subway's policy. If you break that cookie, you can eat it. <laughs> in case you get a job at Subway and you want to eat their cookies. I did not know that. <laughs> I think the same went down at Coldstone Creamery too, which is where I used to work. I used to work at Coldstone. Oh. But I, di I digress. So you, I love the story of these gingerbread houses. So, uh, you know, you go out to Arizona and I believe, so like I missed the part about the, the skiing, um, your ability as a skier, but you did mention that you moved to a mountain town in Arizona. Uh, at what point did you become a skier? Oh, this was, this was, this was, gosh, um, almost a hundred years ago, Kehlani. I was, when I was, when I was a young child. Um, yes, I mean, the, the full, the full disclosure there is that I was uh, ranked among the top 10 skiers in the nation, age six and under. Evidently, I took to it immediately. Still impressive. <laughs> Still it, it, very impressive. <laughs> thank you. For the sole, sole athletic achievement, the, the uh, trophy is, I believe, just still prominently displayed in the family home. I'm surprised you don't have it like displayed in the back of every Zoom call, just <laughs> <laughs> all of my accolades. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you you move to Arizona, you you go to college in a uh, in a mountain town, and there's one snowy winter uh, right before the Christmas break. Uh, tell us this story because this is like right out of a Dickens. Oh. Town. Yes. So yeah, uh, the town's Flagstaff, Arizona, in the northern part of the state. The school's called Northern Arizona University, the Lumberjacks. Um, it's about 7,000 feet above sea level. So it snows a lot. It gets down below freezing nine months out of the year. Uh, big tempers are swing between the day and the night. It could be 35, 40, de 40 degrees difference between noon and night. Uh, and I, mm, I took some years off between high school and college to uh, explore gardening and find myself and write poetry and make paintings and all sorts of things. And then I said, okay, I'm going to school. So I went to college and I started, I figured I'll get a jump on this. I'll take some summer classes to ease into university. Not understanding, of course, that summer classes are condensed versions of regular courses, so they're much more difficult. Didn't go well. First summer didn't go well. So I'm already on the back foot by the time we get to the fall semester, the first proper semester, which I think was 2009. I think so it was fall of 2009. And I wanted to have a broad-based education because the idea is to hopefully get as close to 
possibly knowing everything as a human being can, which is, it's, it's, it's impossible, but I'd like to get as close as I can. So I want to take this broad-based education and I thought I'll take a class, Introduction to Astronomy. I love it, heavenly bodies. Uh, there's some, uh, there's a rather well-known observatory in Flagstaff. Uh, I think it's where they, I don't know if it's where they discovered Pluto, but certainly where they observed Pluto to great Ooh. degree. Uh, and so I take this class and I'm like, all right, I'm there the first couple of days in Introduction to Astronomy. It's going great, I'm loving it. We get to the second week and I realize very quickly that this is beyond my abilities. Oh yeah, it's not all <laughs> just Carl Sagan's The Cosmos. It's a lot of physics. There's a lot of math involved. That's what I was hoping. I was over the billions and billions of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. so I was getting smoked in this Introduction to Astronomy uh, course, uh, dragged down the whole average. Uh, the, the, the semester goes on and on. I'm not getting anything right. I'm not doing anything correctly on the quizzes. It's a real drag. And as I mentioned, it's so Flagstaff, 7,000 feet above sea level, it gets to the last week of the semester, uh, just before the winter break, we get to finals week. And it starts to snow the day before the final. And it snows and it snows and it snows. Like a foot of snow comes down, two feet of snow comes down. A text message and email goes out to all the students saying, we're gonna have to cancel finals week. It's too crazy because it, it, it snows. I think it's like the fourth or fifth snowiest city in the country. I think it's right behind Syracuse. It snows a lot. It snows mm -hmm. a lot in Flagstaff. So people couldn't get to class. The teachers couldn't get in. The staff couldn't get in. The students couldn't get there. And they certainly couldn't get out safely. So they say, we're going to cancel the finals. And then contact your professors. We contact the professor. I contact the professor. And they say, uh, everyone has a choice. You can take the final the first week of the spring semester, or you can keep your grade as it is now. And I say, what is my grade? And he says, well, it turns out, Jackson, you weren't the only person who's terrible at astronomy. Most of the class is failing. So I'm grading the class on a curve. I said, okay, so what's my grade? I was passing by one point. <laughs> That's it, I'm keeping it, I'm keeping well, it. I'm well, don't off. gamble, just like, <laughs> I'm gonna walk, gonna walk away from me. <laughs> yes. So I so, march, I yeah. march back from, from the campus to my little studio apartment in this, this withering snowstorm. And I, I, I can't remember the, if the electricity was off at that point or it was about to be turned off. It was a very grim, very cool, very romantic little studio apartment that nobody ever visited. So I go back to my little studio apartment and I'm, I'm trying to celebrate as much as I can with, a, with a, a malt liquor energy beverage that's no longer commercially available. And I step out onto my little alley porch and across the street from me in a big, beautiful house lived a very good friend of mine named Pat Carter. Um, Great guy. And he happened to step out onto his elevated porch just as I was stepping out onto my little crummy alley porch with my malt liquor energy beverage that's no longer commercially available. And he was wearing a beautiful overcoat and this big red velvet hat. And he starts uh, singing into the snow, a classic, classic English uh, Dickensian type music and just declaring his, his overt joy to be alive as a person, and he says, Jeff Jackson, because they didn't call me Jeff Jackson at the time. Jeff Jackson, what are you doing over there? You gotta come over. I'm making beef wellington. I'm like, what on earth is beef wellington? And he describes, he's got it in the oven, he's in this beautiful pastry shell. So I, so I climb through the snow, up the steps to my dear buddy, Pat Carter's house. And we start singing and laughing and singing uh, uh, Good King Wenceslas, which is the song, of course, we all know. Good King Wenceslas went out on the feast of Stephen, but he knew the second verse. No one knows the second verse. Nobody knows the second <laughs> verse. Nobody even knows what the feast of Stephen is. <laughs> yeah. so, so we, we stayed up all night talking about that. It's uh, yeah, Boxing Day, um, the 26th of December. We started talking about uh, Vincent Sloss being, he was a Duke in Bohemia about a thousand years ago, but he was posthumously promoted to King uh, for the work that he did for the church. So we're, we're just drinking heavily and eating beef wellington in the middle of a blizzard and then everybody from the neighborhood came over because everything was closed. There was nowhere to go, there was nothing else to do and this was just sort of the house where everyone gathered. So everyone comes over and we're all eating beef wellington and drinking things and Pat Carter and I are probably boring everyone to tears discussing, did you know that actually it was Duke Wenceslas and they promoted him after he died at several hundred years later and just, we'd never heard of Duke uh, King Wenceslas in the first place. We stayed over, I don't know, three days. It's, it... 
there was no <laughs> overstaying of the welcome. It was just that in a, it, many a Christmas miracle in that story, my friend. Wow. From barely passing your astro astrology course to this, like with that much snow, did anyone see the closure of school coming? Were you like rooting for the snow to continue to fall or was it, did, did everyone just kind of, was it a surprise? Uh, I was certainly rooting for it. And it, it um, the, the level was not unheard of. It was a lot for sure. Um, and they, they, the, the school was very proactive about it, but I don't think they'd canceled finals before. I think okay. it just happened to hit with Truly. such you right for finals week. Normally, Truly like, oh, a Christmas a miracle. Time. And it sounds like Pete Carter was visited by like three uh, Christmas ghosts like the night before. So he was like very hopped up on the holiday season. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we probably stayed all weekend. Had some uh, beef Wellington. We watched uh, Kitchen Nightmares on a, a, on a brand new Netflix streaming service at the time. It was, it was wonderful. Yeah. Well, that very festive such a yeah that was a really fun story thank you so much for rounding out the evening with some really interesting experiences of you know black market christmas deals in saudi arabia <laughs> all the way through you know three days of beef wellington and kitchen nightmares this has been this has been fun and uh now we're at the you know the end of that part of our programming i'll ask everyone to turn on their cameras and come on back for uh you know a round table a little bit more discussion and uh you know Thank you so much. Oh, there you are, Tova. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I only saw one question come through the Q&A, um, which was from Hetty Serwinka. Uh, she says, when I was a child, you can get pepper pot soup in a Campbell soup can. Do you know if Campbell's soup still sells it? And I know for a fact that no, they do not, nor do they sell their uh, mock turtle soup, which is which are two soups that I uh, was actually in the market for and looking for, uh, but they don't have them anymore. So sorry, Hetty. Uh, <laughs> I have a turtle, a turtle in a uh, Santa hat on the floor that I'm gonna pick up and he's gonna complain about that mock turtle soup. Uh, do you know what they used for the mock? It wasn't, I guess it wasn't real turtle. Hey, mussels, yeah. yes. Was it mussels? I, I'm not sure what Campbell's specifically used, but I've heard of a multitude of different meats for different mock turtle soups but uh yeah that was a delicacy out of philadelphia the um the black caterers put that on the fine dining menu early turtle soup it was a big deal but i always called the campbell's version of pepper pot which my grandmother loved she was a great cook but she somehow loved this canned pepper pot and i think it had a lot of cultural resonance but you know the ingredients were more like a, a melting pot uh than a pepper pot because uh, it wasn't quite as spicy and uh, but they did have tripe in it, which is the original ingredient. Did they really? They they actually canned the tripe. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And um, tripe got a lot of fashion, and so they, you yeah. know. Oh, we've got some more questions coming in. Uh, Mary asks, Jeff, what are you drinking? <laughs> oh, what am I drinking? Uh, it's um, what, what I like to call an approximation. So it's it's almost a margarita, uh, but it's in a, in a in a festive. Um, cocktail uh, glass in the shape of a saguaro cactus. And then I wanted to include strawberries, so then it's red and green like the Christmas, but it's, it's um, some uh, tequila and sparkling soda, strawberries, and a splash of ginger ale. Mm, magnificent. Wait, you mentioned the carrot in there, right? There, oh, well, I took the, I, you know, I took the carrot out. It's here on the side of my desk. Okay, uh, <laughs> so when we started, you had a big giant carrot sticking out of it. I did, yes. The, the kitchen in the house is not quite what we would like it to be. So w ice on hand is uh, is not available. But there are some <laughs> makings in the freezer. So I took some of the mirepoix out and I was like, I'll use carrot. It will then keep it cold longer than just a little strawberry. <laughs> carrot uh, as a garnish, not like when she said carrot, I thought like you had some carrot juice in there. And I was like, oh, he's going for some healthy cocktails too. That's <laughs> just like a big carrot. Yeah. carrot. Unless you eat that garnish, there's so much for the healthy cocktail part. Uh, I'm sure it's great. <laughs> oh, we have a question from Linda who asks, any recommendation for vegetarian specialties for the holidays? Latkes are vegetarian, right? Yeah. I mean, they're not, ve they're not vegan. Yeah. <laughs> Donuts too, no. <laughs> 
Oh, you know what? I, let me answer something you asked me earlier, Kaylani, oh, yeah. uh, about the New Year's tradition. I didn't, um, I don't know what I did, but I didn't answer your question about no how Kwanzaa ends on the last, you know, the last day of Kwanzaa is the first day of the new year. And the tradition of having black eyed peas and collard greens already, you know, on the stove, we, you know, you have to have started that before midnight to bring in that good luck and the greens represent money. Um, I, I, I don't know if it's fake news, but I'm seeing that I'm hearing, I'm finding um, people are saying, oh, that was a tradition all around the world. I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure black Americans in the South created, it made that as a tradition a couple of uh, centuries ago, but you know, and, and black eyed peas come from Africa, collards don't, but, uh, but everybody, it's an American thing now, you know, people, people do that. Uh, so be sure to have some type of greens, leafy greens and some black eyed peas. You know, if you wanted to do tradition, you'd have a ham hock in there, but you could do vegetarian and no ham hock. I find that sprinkling some smoked paprika gives it a nice, um, it'll turn the color, you know, make them a little red, but it's, it's holidays. So why not, right? The red yeah, that's a, paprika. <laughs> that sounds like a really delicious vegetarian holiday dish. I feel like I, I honestly don't have any recommendations for vegetarian dishes at the moment, but if I, if something comes to mind, uh, I will, I will mention it. Uh, and we have lots of garlic and onion always in both those dishes. To add oh yes. Garlic and onion that those are very prominent in a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, like, you know, West African dishes as well, like yasa and, um, oh, is, does it also appear in jollof rice? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, it's, you know, everything is a different uh, family recipe or community recipe. Um, it's so flavorful and delicious. I can't imagine that that it doesn't involve, I know there's finely diced some type of something in the onion family. I don't know about garlic in jollof rice. Ah, we've got uh, from Jules, uh, not a food question, but wondering why Jeff does not have an accent in English, <laughs> an English accent? Great question. <laughs> I, I, I don't have an I, I don't I'm sorry the question is perhaps it was the the holiday song the king oh my gosh I don't even know king Wenceslas Wen Wenceslas no Wenceslas Wenceslas Duke of Bohemia late Duke now I mean, I guess it's not. a shame too because I used to live in Germany and I should like really know that one <laughs> I think it's the Czech Republic now um but, oh, oh okay um the question is, why don't I have it? Uh, I, I guess, well, I used to have uh, a, a lisp and a bit of a stutter. So I guess just 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 hard work, Jules, hard work. I have a question along those lines. Uh, Jeff, do you speak other languages then? Ooh, you know, um, some uh, hotel conversational Spanish. So mm -hmm. things like getting the, uh, uh, if, I, if I find myself in overseas accommodations and I need an iron, I can do that. Uh, and I just, you, would you believe it? I just signed up for Duolingo, uh, but with Latin five days ago. I realized that this is, this cannot go on, not knowing any Latin. So short yeah, answer. That'll be Latin that nobody speaks anymore, that Latin? That's the one. <laughs> no, but it's, it's got the, you know, that was what all the AP kids took when they wanted to ace the SATs because they would, you know, so many roots of our words, uh, have Latin roots, um, I, I, you know, back at you, Tova, like, cause you had mentioned that your mom is from Montreal. Did, yeah. you, grow, did you grow up uh, speaking any Quebecois or? You know, she speaks French and never spoke to me word of French. Wow. So, and she's, she's pretty good. Um, and she's got like the accent down and everything, but, um, but I did grow up with Hebrew. I speak Hebrew and I grew up with Afrikaans. Afrikaans is a major language in South Africa. And we, and when I was young, we were forced to learn it. Um, you know, luckily things have changed and you, and in school, you still do need to take a second language, but it could be any one of our 11 uh, official languages. 11. Uh, but when I was growing up, we had to speak Afrikaans. And so those are my languages. My Afrikaans is really fading, um, but Hebrew I try to use here and there. Do you, are you teaching your your uh, your child's languages I, as well? I am trying. I have not. You know, it's it is so hard to speak to your kids in another language. Yeah, I have to say, like, I, especially I, in the U.S., right? Yeah, 
it's yeah. really hard because we don't need it like we all speak english we all you know you have to make a concerted effort um, yeah, I grew up with a, an Ecuadorian great grandfather wh who influenced me f for having uh, to, to speak Spanish. Um, and I studied and studied and studied. But, you know, we w in, in the States, when, when I was coming up, I don't know if it's the same now, they, we were like in freshman in high school by the time, you know, Spanish was offered. And your brain has all those, like, the brain isn't quite as malleable. Like, you know, yeah. it'd be great if we were taught languages much earlier. I mean, I tried on my own. I would pull books out and Juan y Maria toca la guitarra, you know, and read stuff before I even really knew yeah, how to Yeah, I mean, I, I wish my mom spoke to me in French, but that didn't happen. And and yeah, at, at some point, it just becomes so much more difficult to, I mean, good on you, Jeff. Good luck with the Latin. But it becomes yeah. so much more difficult when you're an adult to learn. <laughs> <laughs> no one to practice with conversational Latin. Yeah, exactly. If you do have someone. I will say, though, I do love having a secret language, though, like we speak in Afrikaans to each other. <laughs> so, Because my husband is also South African. Oh, okay. well, that's helpful. You can say anything. So, the, the about anybody. Is very helpful. Yeah, you can say anything about anyone and they won't know. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Mary. What is the menu for Christmas Eve? Does anyone have anything particular that they're going to make for, for Christmas Eve? Mm. That's a great question. My family, we do hors d'oeuvres on Christmas Eve because everybody's so busy wrapping a million presents. Uh, so, you know, we, and over the years we've gotten really lazy and Costco has great little frozen hors d'oeuvres. You just kind of pop in. <laughs> it's Hello, a, hors d'oeuvres are fun. Are this, this Thanksgiving, um, it's, you know, we were on our own and it was just me my husband and my daughter and we just decided for fun because we really wanted to um make a beef wellington <laughs> Jeff. oh goodness Jeff. Yum, yum. and <laughs> honestly i would do that for christmas eve uh, it's so ridiculous and over the top and like you will never make that in a normal night like you'll, you'll never make a beef wellington you gotta have an excuse to make a beef wellington yeah, yeah. that is an occasion dish for it sure <laughs> But isn't that isn't that also Christmas Eve the night when everybody bakes cookies for Santa? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of baking, yeah. Yeah. So I mean I'm like it's either or. There's either and then you got the big dinner on Christmas Day usually. So it's like there's no major cooking in our family tradition for Christmas Eve. Just the cookie baking, present wrapping, and Costco hors d'oeuvres. Oh goodness, my family has three nurses, so it's usually like someone's on a shift somewhere. So I've been doing a lot of Christmas and Christmas Eve with my husband's family, where they do a lot of uh, charcuterie, like uh, little meats and cheeses, because they have a lot of family that works in the church. So it, while my family is running from hospital to hospital, like his family is running from like this uh, church ceremony and that church ceremony. But, uh, you know, I really love and this year, luckily, um, you know, my mother-in-law is going to be giving us a uh, basket of the normal charcuterie we usually have for Christmas Eve because uh, it's usually just like, yeah, meats and cheeses that are out and we just kind of like everybody's that's running so past and yeah, it, you know, that's kind of what has been Christmas Eve for me for the past five years and uh, it's really, that's like the closest thing that has become uh, to a Christmas Eve tradition for myself. Uh, Jeff, do you have any? Uh, any Christmas Eve menus? Christmas Eve? Yeah, tradition. yeah. Uh, Christmas Eve menu um, mm, tends to be a liquid diet focus. Uh, so we like a, <laughs> a, a cremant, which is, I'm pretty sure, is basically the champagne, but not made in champagne. So it costs a lot less. Bargain. Uh, so <laughs> bubbles. Um, and then there's uh, uh, a brewery out in the southwest, Anchor. Out, out way west. Yes. I think they do a big, they do a Christmas beer every year, and then it has a different type of coniferous tree on the label each year. So I like That's to pick good. one of those up, and they have them in a in a large, large format bottle. Um, so I tend to my uh, duty is mostly uh, beverage based. Whenever we get together, I'm making sure that everyone has mimosas or the or the beer. Yes, that's the great role to have, isn't it, Jeff? Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, it is. That's my favorite role. That's why. That's why there's no cooking. That's why. The, <laughs> that's the real reason, guys. Um, and my sister is vegan now, and so uh, I think it was last year I set out to make her a vegan. Uh, obviously, eggnog is not going to be something that uh, she can drink. She can drink. She can drink. You know these things, but I decided I was going to make her a coquito, uh, which is kind of like. A, Ooh, yes. um, yeah, so I, I I was like, what's a, what can I do for a vegan eggnog? Because she used to love eggnog, and I was like, oh, coquito, which is coming out of the Puerto Rican culture. And I was like, oh, if I can get some really creamy coconut milk and puree all the spices and flavors and lots of delicious rum, um, it was good. Oh awesome. yes, a, another great recommendation. Yeah. What do you got, Sofa? I'm drinking some eggnog eggnog with rum. I was going to ask you about eggnog. Yeah. Yeah, and I put, uh, do you know um, Manitoni Still Works? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're a local distillery, and their rum is like one of my favorite um, favorite spirits. And so I have their rum in eggnog. Oh, Ooh, it's a Pennsylvania nice. rum, a Pennsylvania distilled rum? Yes. My, I'm sorry, guys, my signal's crappy. It's a Pennsylvania rum? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, and it's delicious. Yeah, you guys know. Yeah, rum was like all yeah, in the colonial era a lot of um rum was distilled in uh Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, other places. Hmm. And that's it, that's a sugar cane based drink, right? Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Um linked to the triangle trade coming out of it. It's a byproduct of the sugar cane industry and molasses and uh rum. Those are the three main things coming out of that crop. Um, I've got a question from Camille who asks, please give the ingredients for hibiscus tea, um, which I think again was kind of like a, oh, whatever your preferences are, but uh, Tanya, I'll let you answer that one. Okay, yeah, if you don't find one already spiced, if you wanna make it from scratch yourself, I would get, you can, um, I, I got, the, the, my best batch this week came from loose leaf hibiscus tea. Um, uh, there's like tons of different kinds of, there's some loose leaf uh, hibiscus leaves uh, in a jar. This one is actually bagged. Okay, um, whole, so, so what you're gonna do is depending on how much you're making. So say you're gonna make like four servings. It's, there's a whole ratio thing, but you never really wanna use more than four cinnamon sticks. So about four cinnamon sticks, um, a handful of hibiscus leaves, uh, a maybe like a, quarter inch diced uh, ginger or less because ginger gets really spicy and hot but I like that I like that that ginger burn um, last night I did I plopped in whole nutmeg but before I did that I shaved a little bit in there threw that in there uh, some allspice peppercorns um, was that five at least five spices that I mentioned I think so. I just have, like, I love the, the measurements of like a oh, fistful of hibiscus, like an inch of, you know. <laughs> oh, and then, then you have to like, uh, well, you can sweeten it in your glass later, or you can add a little honey or um, maple syrup, a splash of, you don't have to really add a splash of citrus, uh, lemon juice. You know, I, I did because hibiscus is so nice and tart. And then if you want to invest in some tart cherry juice, which is a uh, really good for you. It's supposed to be good to drink at night too. It's supposed to have a good uh, melatonin in it. Um, you can put a splash of that in there, not too much. And it will look exactly like mulled wine. And, um, and let it simmer, but don't let it boil. Don't let it get too hot. Oh, and then you're gonna need, I don't, it's over there, but like a strainer. Cause I've, cause I've thrown all these loose things in a pot with like a water. Did I mention the water that you need? To <laughs> Key <drink>? ingredient <laughs> to any. <laughs> To any drink is water. <laughs> water. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, you know, you put a strainer on top of the cup and imagine there's a strainer in my hand and then you just pour it over and, and um, pull whatever you want from the strainer to plop it in your glass. I pulled the cinnamon stick out. So that's how I did it. Or you can just cheat and get, go, go get a, you know, a mulling sachet from, from the grocery store. I don't do sachets. I just uh, I just strain things. Beautiful, beautiful. And our last question of the evening. I know time flies, but and I could talk all night with y'all. But you know, it's almost the end of our 
of our awesome party here. But for our last question, uh, you know, what is your favorite holiday tradition? Is there one tradition that you cannot go the holiday season without? Decorating cookies. Oh, decorating cookies, okay. Are there any particular designs um, or any particular cookie recipes that you like? I love, I have a shortbread that I love. Um, it has, and I put a little orange oil in it. So it's just a really simple shortbread, super buttery. It's great. And then gingerbread. I love it. Yeah. And gingerbread house. I mean, that's like new since having a kid making a gingerbread house every year, but it's actually kind of exciting. <laughs> edible one or a shellacked one? <laughs> no, an edible one. <laughs> I have to say though, I noticed, um, so this year I was just in Ikea and I saw they had a gingerbread house and I got it. And I think it was like two or $3 or something. And it's the perfect, it's so well designed, nothing was broken. Um, and it made it really easy because we just had to make royal icing. I think it was wow. a little gingerbread Allen wrench to put it together. Oh my God. Oh my God, they should totally do that. <laughs> The th yeah, the thing I absolutely cannot um, ever not not do is have that pot of greens and beans on that stove by mm -hmm. New Year's Day. I mean, there have been some times where it hasn't been simmering on New Year's Eve, but do not let uh, midnight strike on January 1st <laughs> without having simmered up and or consumed at least a forkful of each of these things. I wish I could take yours. <laughs> and the black eyed peas. Cause it's like, oh no, cause then you're just gonna jinx your whole year. Like it's, it's, it's literally like, <laughs> like a panic sets in, you know? And um, yeah, I have friends who host a New Year's thing and everybody's like, you made enough beans, right? You got the, the greens good? You know, it's like people, you know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's my, yeah, it's, yeah, obsessive. And this is a new tradition now. The, the hot spice hibiscus holiday drink. Beautiful. Heard it first. Heard it first. <laughs> That's a tricky question because it's tough to to, to, to to decouple or to parse the different uh, experiences, you know, to, 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 to segment them in that way. Um, because one tends to, at least in my experience, one tends to flow quite naturally into the next, into the next. So is it the, you know, it's like, oh, well, of course, making, making, going out and building something in snow is great, but is there always snow? Uh, no, there isn't always snow. Uh, the, like watching of Elf, of course, must, <laughs> must do. Thoroughly enjoyed uh, White Christmas. Oh, we didn't even talk about the specials, right? Yes. <laughs> but I have to pick one. I think I think it's I think it's I think it's the tree. There's something about the 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 lights, the the magical lights. No, that that uh, the the smell of a, a good coniferous uh, tree permeating the house. I think that if I had to pick the one, it's just just a hangout time, hangout time with my good friend Tannenbaum, the tree. Exactly. I mean, yeah, the, the decorating a Christmas tree with ornaments that are reflective of like your personality. Like, I don't know if you could tell, but our Christmas tree has the Death Star on top of it. Oh, uh, cool. so all of our ornaments are like hand picked things that we all like really, really like. And some of them are extremely specific. Like there's Space Ghost. Uh, there's the Animaniacs because they came back this year. We've got a lot of Star Wars. We've got a lot of, you know, so just things that we really love and really enjoy. And it is fun. Um, my husband being the collector that he is, he's very like neat and tidy. So he's got these like bins that are, all of the ornaments still have their original keep, like Hallmark keepsake uh, boxes and everything just like nicely goes in and like everything is so tidy. But when you bring out those ornaments it you know, and you find a place for it on the tree, it really does kind of remind you of Christmas's past or when, like, I remember every moment that we bought those ornaments and what, you know, that first initial feeling was or, or when ornaments are gifted to us. I, you know, what? I, ever since this question, I never realized like how important that tree is um, and, or how special um, ornaments can be. But, uh, you know, speaking of specials, like I really love Christmas Vacation. I watch that every single holiday season with <laughs> Chevy Chase and uh 
every time I watch it, there is something new. There is comedy just steeped into that film. There's always something very subtle that I missed in my whole lifetime, I you know I miss like the scene in Walmart when he's putting the dog food in the cart, and every time Clark puts something fragile, and then the you know Uncle Eddie puts something heavy, and you just hear the light bulbs break. It yeah, it's so there's all these like really yeah that's those are my two holiday traditions. It's fresh every year, right? Something step pops out that you're like I don't that I never that noticed that. before. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm glad you said I was going to ask you. I'm glad you talked about the ornaments because um, as you were talking, I was like, oh, I have the perfect ornament gift for Kehlani based on your genre and theme. Oh, goodness. And we can roam the earth free again and visit each other on, you know, holidays. We can do like a little ornament exchange. Yeah, that would be <laughs> lovely. Gloves on. Kehlani, got a gift for this year, a little Santa with a mask. Yeah, that, we should like commemorate something. With that, <laughs> I love to get. I love to gift ornaments, whether or not people have trees or not. You know, I don't know. Yeah. It's just like fun to do, like especially if you know something about the person and their personality. It's a really fun thing to do. You know, and you the, the, laugh. the quirky thing is, is like some of these ornaments, like my husband will just decorate his office desk with. So there's like a series of ones that are uh, little arc mini arcade games. Like there's. Um, Galaga, we've got one for Pac-Man and a couple others and they ha they play the original like music to them too oh, so wow. when the holiday's over he actually just goes and they're not like overtly Christmassy so he puts them on his desk and enjoys them all year round. Multi-purpose. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much all for for you know for offering your amazing expertise for sharing your uh, culinary and cultural traditions with us up for this very lovely uh, holiday party, a uh, virtual holiday party for WHYY. And to all of those at home watching, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all of your fantastic questions. And I hope you enjoy the holiday season. And thank you again so much for your support in WHYY and have a happy holiday season. Thank you. Happy holiday.